Arc of Infinity kicks off Season 20 of Doctor Who, when John Nathan Turner thought it would be a good idea to bring back old enemies of the Doctor in every single story. Admittedly, half of these stories feature the same villain, so it's not as bad as it could be, uh, but when combined with the following special, The Five Doctors, it's a lot of continuity to deal with, none of which I was aware of when I watched it the first time round. Uh, this story brings back Omega from The Three Doctors, uh, which I don't think I'd watched at the time, uh, but even if I had, I wouldn't have recognised him, as he now looks completely different. It's a beautifully designed costume, but the original was much more menacing. Uh, his plan to cross over from the Antipathy universe is rather complicated, uh, involving stealing the Doctor's biodata, whatever that is, and then invading the TARDIS to bond with him, whatever that means. It doesn't help that he uses something called the Ark of Infinity, which is barely explained, despite being the title of the story. Uh, it seems to be some sort of gateway between the matter and antimatter universes, uh, but it's never entirely clear. Uh, some sort of visual representation of it might have helped. The Doctor is summoned back to Gallifrey for the first time in five years, and it's still just as dull as it was last time. Now it looks like a hotel lobby, uh, with sofas and spherical lamps all over the place, but the High Council are still as ancient and corrupt as they ever were. Everybody there is alarmingly eager to execute the Doctor, purely for being targeted by Omega, uh, even his old friend President Barusa, who is the only returning character. Uh, the only person who's on his side is somebody called Damon, who we've never seen before. Uh, it might have made more sense if they'd brought back Leela, or even Android, but we do get a mention of them at least. Uh, fortunately, the Doctor's execution does not take, and he ends up floating in the Matrix, uh, which looks different every single time we see it. Here it looks particularly unimpressive, uh, just a black void full of spider webs, where he has to float around awkwardly uh, before returning to the real world. Uh, meanwhile, the whole of the story is unfolding in Amsterdam. This is by far the best looking side of the narrative, though no less confusing. Omega has somehow acquired a TARDIS, or possibly built one himself, uh, but it's not clear if it's made of matter or antimatter. Uh, he's landed in Amsterdam, uh, for some reason to do with it being below sea level, which somehow allows him to cross over more easily. His servant, the Ergon, looks ridiculous, uh, like a giant chicken. Uh, to be fair, it doesn't look too bad when it's in silhouette and you can barely see it. But in 99% of the scenes, it's lit very brightly, just like everything else, which really doesn't help. The Ergon kidnaps a hapless traveller, who by an incredible coincidence turns out to be Tegan's cousin. Bringing Tegan back was a good idea, uh, though why they pretended to write her out in the last story remains a mystery. Her new look definitely suits her, uh, with short hair and an even shorter outfit. It might have made more sense if Omega had tracked her down, specifically to use her as bait for the Doctor, but as it is he just kidnaps her completely by chance, uh, which is a really odd story point. Uh, the whole thing culminates in a big chase through Amsterdam, uh, which is a very photogenic city, so it looks great. Peter Davison doubles up as Omega when he takes the form of the Doctor, and I remember it being really creepy as a youngster uh, to see the bad guy looking just like the Doctor. In the end, the Doctor ends up shooting him dead, uh, which is starting to become a habit, uh, but I guess you can excuse it, as Omega did steal the Doctor's very identity. And Tegan invites herself back on board the TARDIS at the end. Uh, which the Doctor does not look at all pleased about. Uh, the guest cast are rather more impressive on the Gallifrey side than in Amsterdam. Uh, Colin Baker is the obvious standout as Maxwell, uh, stomping about with a ridiculous hat and making the most of his screen time. Uh, he certainly has charisma, uh, but it's hard to see why Jonathan Turner thought he would make a good Doctor, uh, judging by this performance. Uh, veteran actor Leonard Sachs uh, takes over as Barusa, uh, but really he could have been playing a totally new character as his relationship with the Doctor is barely mentioned. And Michael Goff, as Chancellor Heading, uh, gives a strong performance. Uh, despite being the traitor, uh, he's not evil so much as deluded uh, by his hero worship of Omega. His identity is hidden during his scenes with Omega in the first two episodes, uh, but he's got such a distinctive voice uh, they might as well not have bothered. The DVD has nearly an hour of extras. Antimatter from Amsterdam is a 35-minute documentary uh, presented by Sophie Aldred, uh, who they flew out to Amsterdam, along with a writer, uh, to present the links in the freezing cold, while the cast give their memories from a warm studio. It's good value, uh, with lots of stories about them running around Amsterdam and everybody slanging off the Ergon. The Omega Factor is a 15-minute feature, looking at the character of Omega, uh, from the three Doctors right through to a big Finnish audio. There's three minutes of deleted scenes, 
uh, with more footage of them all running around Amsterdam and 11 minutes of raw studio footage, uh, which is interesting as you see Omega taking off his mask and how they filmed the scenes of the Doctor and Omega together. Uh, overall, it's uh, not as bad as some of last year's stories. Uh, it's very pacey and has some great location filming, but the story is far too complicated and doesn't make much sense. I'll give it 4 out of 10. Next week, the Mara returns in Snake Dance. Maybe Tegan will regret forcing her way back on Bob Subscribe to see what I make of that, and I'll see you next time.